right, good evening, everyone. I think we'll get started here. Just doing a quick sound check. Lee or Dave, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Okay, great. All right. Um, well, welcome everybody to our virtual informational meeting on the Summers Beach State Park Draft Environmental Assessment. I uh, appreciate you joining us here uh, tonight. Um, this is intended to be an informational meeting uh, where we'll go over uh, some of our development proposals for the Summers Beach State Park property and then answer any questions you might have about this project uh, since it is out for a 30 day public comment through February 13th, 2023. So I'm going to go through some introductions uh, so you can meet some of our Fish, Wildlife and Parks staff and uh, then hand it over to Dave Landstrom who will go through uh, the draft environmental assessment. Um, so to start with, I am Dylan Tabish with Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks here in Kalispell. I'm our communication and education program manager. And Dave, do you mind introducing yourself? Sure. Hello, everybody. My name is Dave Landstrom. I'm the Region 1 Parks and Outdoor Recreation Manager with Fish, Wildlife and Parks. Awesome. And Lee? Oop, Lee, you're still muted. Sorry, uh, Lee Anderson, I'm the regional supervisor for Fish, Wildlife and Parks uh, based out of Kalispell. Thank you, Lee. And Randy, I saw Randy pop on. Do you mind introducing yourself, Randy? You bet. I'm Randy Romley. I'm with Design and Construction here in Helena. And when we get this project rolling, I'll be the project manager on the construction aspect of it and the design as well. Thanks, Randy. And let's see, last but not least, Nate, do you mind introducing yourself if you're available? I know you just came in from the field. Hey, you bet. I'm Nathan Reiner, Warden Captain, Region 1. Awesome. Thanks, Nate. Uh, and I th Yeah, so those are the staff who we have here who can answer questions near the end, if you have any. Um, like I said, we're going to be going through uh, some slides, not too many, probably about a half an hour's worth of information. Uh, and then we will have time for questions to help answer any questions you might have. We can always go back to a slide, um, revisit uh, something if, it, if it's unclear to you. Um, we've got time set aside for that. So um, this is being recorded. So this video will be posted tomorrow on the Summers Beach State Park planning page. And at the end, I'll show everybody where that page is. Hopefully you already know where it is and where all this information about the draft environmental assessment is located, as well as all the past work we've done to date, which Dave's about to go over. So um, I'll make sure at the end to kind of walk folks through uh, how to find that on our website. Um, if you have questions at the end, uh, if you could raise your hand and I'll go over this again when we get to this point, but you'll raise your hand, I'll unmute you and you can ask your question. Um, you can also, if you're thinking of a question during a presentation, you can type it into the chat. You should be able to type something in there and then I'll go over and, and read. We'll read that there at the end of the presentation as well. So whichever would be uh, easiest for you to record your question by writing it into the chat or raising your hand at the end and I'll unmute you. Uh, important to know that this isn't a public hearing. So uh, this is really intended for information gathering. We want all of you to be able to provide informed input during this public comment process. Uh, and so tonight's simply for asking and answering questions. If you have a comment, uh, you know, the, the way to do that is through the website. And I'll show you that again at the end. We've got an online portal that's super simple that you can put your comment in that way. You can send an email. I'll show you that email address at the end as well. Uh, or you can do an old fashioned letter to us. Uh, we'll, we'll take any written form of comment that we can get. And we prefer the written form because then it's your words directly how you worded them and it's not up to to one of us to have to um, hear a verbal comment and try to type it down really quick and, and maybe miss the exact uh, comment that you're you're putting in so that's why we're really emphasizing these written comments so I'll go over that at the end but um, main message is that these are for questions tonight and then if you have comments I'll show you how to submit those to us through the comment period um, I think that's all the housekeeping. I don't know if I missed something. If I did, let me know, Dave. Otherwise, I'm going to hand it off to Dave Landstrom. Okay, thank you, Dylan. 
And and thanks everyone uh, who's on this call tonight, and uh, and particularly to those of you who've been participating in this process for a number of months now. Um, we've we've had a, a a pretty rigorous public involvement process in the planning stages of this proposal, and I know I'm sure there are folks on this call who've participated all the way along, and and welcome to those of you who are just getting engaged. Um, it has been a process. In October of 2021, Summers Beach was acquired from the Slider family and is now Montana's newest state park in the state park system. It's 104 acres uh, on the northeast shore of Flathead Lake. And uh, upon acquisition, which in itself was a was a lengthy process, took well over a year. Uh, immediately then last year, we began uh, a pretty significant project. Some of you may have seen it. Uh, it's rather elaborately called a dynamic equilibrium beach, uh, which was really um, a, a shoreline protection measure uh, that we took uh, using a technique that is different than traditional shoreline protection and uh, and is uh, actually a little more ecologically sound. Uh, we also, beginning last summer, developed some interim man uh, uh, interim park amenities. Um, the park is already been seeing use. It was seeing use previously under private ownership, and uh, and we were aware of the fact that we needed to provide some uh, some very basic amenities for people to start using the park. So we now have an entry, um, a, a parking lot, both of which are gravel, and uh, and some basic regulatory signage and and fee station at that park. Following. Uh, uh, you know, those interim developments, we started a process working with the public to, to gain baseline information about how uh, the community and potential park users would want to see this park developed and, and function and feel. So in March of last year, uh, we initiated a scoping survey, which was, uh, was, was very well utilized, over 1,200 uh, responses in that survey to gather some baseline information from people as to what they hope to see there. And using that baseline information, we focus that into um, some more specific questions and information gathering in the form of two open house meetings in July. One was on site. You'll see a photo there that's actually on on park property. And then we held a second one uh, virtually to gather further input and to help and to help us narrow down uh, uh, information into proposals for development. And since uh, really since about August of last year, we've been working on and preparing uh, this draft environmental assessment, which highlights the options and alternatives uh, for, for moving forward in the park. And, and I'm going to get into those alternatives. I do want to just share with you a little bit of the baseline information and uh, and and preferences that we heard from the public in that planning process that resulted in and are reflected in the alternatives that we offer. Uh, very basically, we started out with some questions to help uh, help us place this new state park within the Montana's uh, state parks classification system. And that's a, a process in which we classify state parks in the system to help uh, both staff and public understand what to expect uh, when they visit there. So we start off with a uh, determining a service level preference. I won't read all of the text on this slide. This is very well detailed in the environmental assessment, and I encourage you to take the time to uh, uh, download that document and and read this information. But in essence, what we heard from uh, through through the preliminary survey was a preference for the park to remain either as a rustic setting, a service level, or um, core or enhanced, which both infer um, some level of uh, development um, uh, for service level. We further asked what uh, experience category uh, people would want to see in this park. And, and again, that's part of our classification process. And our classification, uh, our uh, experience categories are heritage, recreation, and natural. And again, you can read those descriptors there of what those different uh, experience categories are. 
but we saw not surprisingly 48 percent um, preference for a natural experience category and then the remaining uh, was uh, either recreational or heritage and when we speak when we say heritage we're talking um, parks that tend to enhance uh, specific um, historical or heritage stories in in montana's history and and the truth is is that all state parks in our system are some blend of these three but we we asked people to uh, identify their priority or their top choice uh, for experience category in this park so a combination of an experience category and a service level is how we classify a park We also, in that preference, in that in the early survey in March, we tried to get a gauge for which amenities uh, people would like to or not want to see in the new state park at Summers Beach. And um, the, the, the amenities that rose to the top for people who did want to see amenities uh, were picnic areas or shelters, uh, restrooms that you could that flush as opposed to vault latrines, a hand launch for for boating or recreational equipment at the lake and uh, and things that were more enhanced showers um, visitor centers amphitheaters etc were were the least popular um we we did gauge in a preference for trail style and type um there is a strong interest in trails in this park and User trails have already begun to form as people utilize the site. Uh, the one thing that uh, that we're aware of is that this park will accommodate a non-motorized trail system, and uh, that it, we have the potential for for highly accessible trails within the park, largely due to the fact fact that it's flat, and we're starting with a largely clean slate. So we can, uh, if if the decision is made to develop trails. Um, develop a connectivity within the park with accessible trails and also um, provide connect connectivity to trails outside of the park should they um, should they be developed at a future time. We talked with folks about um, in our survey about their desire to see overnight accommodations or not. And we also asked that question again in our open house uh, meetings. We got somewhat mixed review uh, or mixed results um, in in the scoping survey results. There was a strong a 55% uh, preference anyway for not providing camping or overnight opportunities in the park, with 38%. Uh, being receptive to that, there was a small percentage that didn't respond to that question. So um, that's the that's the difference there. In the open house, we saw kind of the inverse of that. Uh, and 23% of participants were in favor of day use only. And 77% of the folks who participated in those meetings um, indicated some interest in overnight accommodations. One thing that was clear in both processes was uh, that there was not support. There was not strong support for RV camping uh, in, in either of those sessions. And one thing that you'll see in our action alternatives, there is uh, a no action alternative as well, and we'll go into that. In our two action alternatives, there are some base features and these are features that we typically provide um, just for, for uh, public safety and operational efficiency that helps us steward the sites. Um, and they're features in most of our state parks here in Region 1, including those other state parks around Flathead Lake. I'll go through those very briefly and you'll see them uh, later on in some of the action alternatives. We typically try to install a small entry station. It allows us to make contact with visitors, uh, which is particularly valuable during busy periods. Um, our entry stations are intended to be staffed, but they also function when they're unstaffed as a self-pay or self-regulatory uh, entry station. 
We try to add host sites in our parks. It allows us to put volunteers or paid staff in the parks at busy periods, and they can be there uh, not only to provide visitor service, um, but also to um, you know assist with any problems that are occurring in the park. And we, we do that by providing a full service RV campsite and they bring their own RVs and stay in them while they're working and then those sites are empty uh, when when there's no host on site. And again, we do this in most of all of this, all of our state parks with the exception of Wild Horse Island uh, on in Region 1. Restrooms, of course, are, are a requirement and fortunately this park has access to municipal sewer, which does give us the, give us the opportunity to install flushable uh, restrooms, which is particularly nice these days because it's getting harder and harder to, uh, to, to, to have vault latrines pumped. We're still able to do it, but it is more difficult and becoming costly. And uh, oftentimes the, uh, the other restrooms are frankly just more pleasant. We also have the opportunity um, to provide municipal drinking water. So we, in our action alternatives, we propose um, a post bib for for people to get drinking water while they're in the park. Administrative building, um, you'll see this further into the presentation. Uh, and this this would be a very small building for the purpose of storing equipment and supplies for groundskeeping and maintenance and 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 other things, and po potentially a small workstation for staff when they're in the park. Wayfinding signage is a component of any of our parks. Um, and that's simply internal and external signage on how to find the park and how to find your way around the park once you're inside of it. And then lastly, as we've already discussed, uh, universally accessible trails to provide connectivity within the park, non-motorized connectivity within. Um, and before uh, we were able to, before we uh, engaged in any development of alternatives, of course, there uh, were a couple of very obvious planning considerations with this site. Those of you who are familiar with with uh, the state park understand that it's bordered on the east by the federal uh, Flathead Lake waterfall production area. That's uh, uh, an area that's owned and operated by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, we've already been in contact with them um, this this winter about developing uh, strategies by which we can assist in the park with uh, reducing the amount of trespass that occurs during the nesting closure on that waterfall production area. So we're keenly interested in working with Fish and Wildlife Service to address that concern. There are also two in holdings that are owned by Burlington Northern Santa Fe BNSF. Um, it's part of the part of the uh, history of the site as well. And um, these in holdings are generally not available for the for public use. There's one potential exception to that that I'll discuss a little later. Um, but remediation has been completed in portions of, uh, of those inholdings, and there are underground contaminants that have been, uh, you know, that need to remain there. And so it'll be really important that we don't disturb uh, those uh, remediation efforts or, con or contaminants in, in any future projects in the park. So those we're keenly aware of uh, those considerations. And lastly, the guiding principle uh, in the development of these alternatives, and this is paraphrased directly from uh, the purpose and need statement in the environmental assessment. And simply put, the intent of developing recreational amenities is to guide and enhance use in a way that minimizes visitor impacts, conserves important natural, cultural, and recreational resources. Benefits include improved accessibility, opportunities for outdoor recreation, wildlife viewing, and interpretive and educational programming. The environmental assessment document itself is, uh, is a, a, a legal process that we undertake uh, in just about any action we take in a state park or in any fish, wildlife, and parks property. And the EA is intended to describe the need for the action of the purpose and need, describe proposed actions and alternatives, analyze the potential adverse and or positive consequences of the alternatives, 
and discuss specific procedures for mitigating adverse consequences associated with our actions. And uh, most importantly as well is to provide an opportunity for you, the public, to review and comment on that EA. And so we're hope we're hopeful that you will do that. And again, at the end of at the end of this uh, presentation, Dylan will be sure you've got that information on on how to do so. So let's jump into the alternatives uh, now that you've got that. Now that the table is set and you understand the process we've uh, uh, taken thus far to get to this point, we want you to know that because there's a uh, we want you to know that uh, there's a lot of uh, careful consideration and work and thought that goes into presenting alternatives and developing them. And uh, and like any action action we propose, we always have an a, a, a no action alternative, which is uh, as it sounds uh, uh, that we take no action beyond what we've done already uh, without a further proposal. And so uh, under the no action, of course, we would not develop any additional uh, opportunities that were identified in our planning efforts with with uh, the public. Uh, the trails would be limited to those that are created by people. And if you've been in the site recently, you'll see that there is one main trail that's uh, a user created trail that gets access from the parking area to Flathead Lake. Uh, it's not accessible from this from a legal standpoint for folks with disabilities. So we would not enhance that uh, access for folks with disabilities and the host sites wouldn't be provided. Uh, so we would not have staff on site, um, you know, living on site uh, during the busy periods. Administrative functions would be conducted remotely and our equipment and supplies would be stored remotely and, and transported to the park as needed. And basic sanitations would be need would be met uh, really in the way that they're being met right now, which is placement of uh, portable toilets and, and trash receptacles, um, which are currently there as well right now in the existing parking lot would remain there. So it would remain largely intact, um, at least in the immediate future. The first action alternative uh, is alternative B. And I've broken this down into a series of four slides to help uh, digest it in in pieces. And so this alternative does provide visitor amenities and and uh, you know management uh, functions like we mentioned in the base amenities. Uh, but but these amenities that we offer here are consistent with the the setting and service levels that we heard um, during the public input process. So the administrative site and main entrance would remain where the, where they are now. Um, we propose to make that temporary gravel road and parking lot the permanent entry point and parking lot. You see that there in the north central region of the park. Um, and we would we would propose to, to pave that, um, which um, makes the, the maintenance and control of uh, water more predictable. And that is the location, as you can see, just on the inside of that curve as you come into the park, that is the location where we would place uh, an entry station, a small 12 by 16 storage building, and the two camp host sites. And then on the interior of the parking lot curve, um, we would place uh, in, in this uh, alternative, we would place a flushable restroom, flushing restroom, um, the natural playground, and a uh, 24 by 36 foot picnic shelter, which would be available to the public for rentals for up to groups of 50. So in the images on the left, we're, I've tried to provide you with some examples of um, what those particular amenities might look like. And um, the typical entry station that you see there is from Wayfair State Park, and that's very common in all of the state parks on Flathead Lake and Whitefish Lake and elsewhere. Um, and so it's a small visitor contact station at the entry of the entrance to the park. The picnic shelter is typically a, um, you know, a, a rustic, attractive looking uh, shelter like you see here. This also is a shelter that we've recently placed in Wayfair's and is available to the public 
um, just for general use or for you're also able to reserve it for you know family gatherings or, or the other functions. The typical uh, the natural playground um, you'll see this included in the alternative, even though it was not one of the uh, amenities that was highly favored in our process. We, we chose to offer it at least as an alternative because we wanted to be sure that folks understood that we're not talking about um, a traditional playground with brightly colored uh, swing sets and sleds or slides and, and, and other apparatuses. The concept here is really just a play area for small kids using natural features, sort of like the one that you see in that picture that we don't have a specific design in mind, but something uh, of that nature right there. And uh, and all of those amenities would be clustered there near the parking area, so uh, they're they're visually screened by vegetation to some degree and uh, and don't occupy any of the larger open spaces in the park. The second element to alternative B are amenities that we that that, that would be developed on or near uh, the lakeside or the lakefront. And so I'll start um, with the uh, north if you look on the northernmost portion of that shoreline you'll see that we propose here a hand launch it's that circular cul-de-sac uh, that you see near the water's edge this was a feature originally when this site was being proposed as a fishing access several years ago and it remains a popular um, uh, feature it, it remained a popular feature through our public process and it would allow visitors to bring um, boats or other recreational equipment that they can carry by hand from that cul-de-sac to the water's edge and, and place. Um, it's not, it, it, we're not proposing a boat ramp or dock like you've seen in, you know, in our other state parks around Flathead Lake. And uh, the majority of the public would drop off their equipment and then return to the parking lot to park. Um, obviously, that's a, a good walk back, um, but it was pretty clear that we didn't want to uh, create a great deal of parking down in that region of the park, um, not only for view shed, but it's also wet there frequently. Um, the exception, as you will see there in the drawing, is that we do provide a, sh a small number of, of ADA compliant parking spaces for folks with mo special mobility needs, so they could bring a kayak or a boat place it in the water and then park more closely to it. We propose a, a boardwalk trail, a, a short section of boardwalk trail to uh, an, an, uh, an overlook so that people with mobility needs could get to the lake and get to the lake uh, shore and enjoy um, you know, a lake shore experience as well. The, the picture that you see there is not precisely the type of boardwalk that would be there, but it gives you a rough idea of what that might look like uh, in the boardwalk example. And then you'll also see a uh, an enhancement of that dynamic beach. So the upper left photo that you see there is of the it says SBSP uh, West Side Beach. That's the work we did last year, and that's what it looks like on the west side of uh, the southwest shoreline of the park right now. And it's actually uh, it's actually quite pleasant to to utilize also as a beach because that's smooth rock. So we would enhance further that shoreline protection uh, for a segment of the shoreline, uh, which will help us accommodate the periods where we're above a typical full pool, which happened quite a bit last year, and um, and provide enhanced uh, protection of those wetlands and and um, as well as it it's friendlier to use for when people do go out and use the lake shore. So uh, you see an enhanced uh, uh, dynamic equilibrium beach there with a with a spit or a, or a horn, if you will, that would be made that would be uh, constructed of that similar rock type and utilized uh, for the public by the public and as well as um, erosion control. Lastly, in the southwest corner of the uh, park, we would propose that that trail that that the Burnell Avenue enters the state park on the west uh, boundary, and then that becomes a park road. We would convert that 
uh, as a pedestrian trail. And you could take a trail down to the shoreline there and we would place a vault latrine. It's too far from the uh, from the municipal sewer line to run uh, to 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 use a flushing toilet there. So that one would be a vault latrine. That that road would be available for administrative use to service that latrine, um, but for public use, it would be walk in and uh, and a small picnic shelter that would accommodate up to three tables, picnic tables. I've given an example of a picnic shelter that size that we have at Whitefish Lake State Park. Uh, so envisioning something of about that size there. Lastly, in alternative B, we um, we talk about trails and landscaping. And uh, what we're proposing in this alternative is a is a trail network throughout the park that provides um, a loop opportunity um, as well as potential connectivity between the northeast corner of the park and the southwest corner of the park. And that's where that possible use of one of the BNSF in holdings comes in. We are in discussions with BNSF about uh, a trail easement or uh, across the northern portion of their property. It is private property. And uh, but we're, we're in discussions with them about the the potential to place a trail there and thus be able to connect the two uh, large pieces of the state park. Um, and so uh, if, if we're able to reach that agreement, that would persist in this alternative. Um, when we talk about landscaping at this park, and we do uh, uh, go into this in greater depth in the document in the EA itself, our intent there would be to convert that what is now 18 to 20 acres of alfalfa into a more natural setting that would uh, have a greater diversity of plantings and, and plant communities, um, provide a little better uh, quality wildlife habitat and security, as well as more interesting ground for trails and, and other park utilization. But as you see, the bulk of it there remains as open space uh, to protect the view shed and the and the features that are near there are the qualities. Landscaping would be a f more a form of adding uh, low berms. If you see in the lower left uh, illustration there, the intent of that il illustration is simply to show you that they would be they 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 would not be intended to block views from neighboring residential properties of the of the valley or the mountains or the other views that they enjoy from there now, but they would provide some um, buffering from neighbors uh, for neighbors to, um, you know, to other amenities in the park or to people using a trail system. Uh, trails would be, um, uh, you know, would be intended again to be a of a surface that would accommodate accessibility, but at this stage it appears that would be a more of a crushed aggregate style trail like you see that's a, actually a trail in Lone Pine State Park um, and we've utilized that type of trail uh, there extensively with with good success and we would uh, earmark those trailheads or I'm sorry mark those trailheads which would be um, there would be three uh, three trailheads one at um, uh, the, the northwest corner of the park where Burnell Avenue comes into the park, that would be a trailhead. A trailhead would be located just uh, south of the parking lot. And then another trailhead would be up, uh, located up in the northeast corner of the park. And so that uh, that would provide walking access to the park. We wouldn't be placing a parking location up there, but it simply be for folks arriving on foot or bicycle to to enter in those locations. So alternative B in its entirety looks like this. Um, that's all of those amenities. Um, and you can find these same you can find this image in the in the EA. And um, and of course these will be this presentation will be online too. So you can go back and look at these slides, uh, you know, on, at, on your own pace um, as you like. So that's alternative B. Our our final alternative and it is the preferred alternative as listed in the EA is alternative C. And this one requires fewer slides because 
alternative C is everything that we included in alternative B with the addition of uh, overnight opportunity. And so in this slide, I highlight where that where those proposals are for overnight opportunity. And I'll start with in the northeast corner, you see what is uh, uh, noted as a shared group uh, campsite, a shared group hike bike uh, campsite. We have these installed in a number of parks in the Montana State Park System. There are uh, two parks down in the Swan Valley, Salmon and Placid that have these installations. And then here in the Flathead, we've got um, the photos you see are here are from Wayfair State Park, and we also have a similar installation at Whitefish Lake State Park. And these sites are modeled a little bit after what uh, Glacier National Park has done, which is uh, a series of first come first serve tent sites that are available for people who arrive uh, really under their own power by bicycle, uh, by water or on foot. And um, and you might end up being the only one in the site that night or if other people show up, um, you know, you're going to have company. And in this proposal, we show five small tent pads similar to what six, I'm sorry, similar to what we see at Wayfarers. Um, provide a, a small shelter and commons area for people to prepare meals uh, and, and gather. And then um, like any of our camp uh, camping amenities in the Flathead, we offer um, and install um, animal resistant trash and food storage containers similar to those that you would see in a national park or in any of our state parks around the region if you've if you've gone to those and then on the west side of the park just inside from the burnell um, access in this section in this alternative we propose three small cabins uh, almost identical to the ones that we have just recently installed at finley point state park uh, or the unit finley point unit of flatted lake state park they're 12 foot by 12 foot, extremely basic. They offer electricity. Uh, there's no running water. Um, and uh, these would be available for rent, uh, nightly rent that is, under the campsite reservation system. And people who would rent these um, uh, cabins would have access to, uh, uh, would have a code to a gate so they could drive to their cabins no further than the turnaround at the restroom and uh, and return. The general public would still access um, that portion of the park on foot if they wanted to walk down to the lakefront. And this um, these cabins would be served by a single vault latrine that would be placed in approximate to all three of them. So a very rustic, uh, a, a very rustic cabin experience and um, available for rent like other cabins and yurts in our park system. So alternative C complete is simply a combination of those two action alternatives. Uh, alternative C is. Is, uh, you know, all the day use amenities plus plus overnight opportunity. Um, so those are the those are the the action alternatives. Um, within uh, the environmental assessment that you're going to review and, and potentially comment on. That's what I have for slides. I, I do encourage you to uh, download that document and, and read it. There's there's a great deal more detail than I'm able to go through in, in this presentation, but hopefully this gives you a broad overview of what our proposals are. And um, this is the point where we stop talking and let you talk and ask any questions you might have. And I'm going to turn it over to Dylan. He's got a, a process uh, by which uh, we can do that. And before we dive into that part, I just want to thank you again for your participation. And I'll leave this slide up for the moment. You're all you're welcome to reach out to me on your own if you've got questions that you couldn't get to tonight or if you um, you know if you're having trouble getting copies of the environmental assessment. Um, you know, I'm happy to to help you out here. And if you you can also find this information on the Fish, Wildlife and Parks webpage, but I'll leave it up here for a moment as well for anyone who wants to copy that down. Yeah, thanks, Dave. 
And uh, what I might do too, I'll let this hang here for just a minute, and then I might have you stop sharing so I can show the website. Okay. Um, I'll give it here just another second. And yeah, uh, once we do the website, you can put that back up if you'd like. And I'm sure we might need to be scrolling back through that presentation anyhow. So. Okay, there you go. Right. Thank you. So I'm what I'm going to do, folks, is just walk you through uh, how to find all this information on our website, how to comment. Uh, I want to make sure that's abundantly clear and then we'll come back and answer any questions you might have. Um, so again, tonight is to answer questions and help you understand exactly all the information we just sent your way. Um, to comment on this proposal, you got a few few ways to do it. So here's our Fish, Wildlife and Parks website. Um, you can go up here in the top right and you can click and search Summers Beach State Park and that'll take you to where you need to go or from the, the home page, click on State Parks and scroll down and right here on the left, here's our planning page. Um, so all the information Dave just shared, including more information, a map of the park, um, how to comment, that is right here. So Again, the ways that you can provide us comment through February 13th is to click here and that'll take you to the EA page. Here's the EA. If you wanna download that PDF, that is right there for you. Um, here's the deadline, you got till 5 p.m. February 13th. And then here's the simple place where you can put your comments uh, and then you submit them that way and that goes into um, a form for us so that we can collect that input and review that input. Um, so that's one way is through the online portal. Uh, of course, you can write us input. You can uh, write us a letter or if you come into our Fish, Wildlife and Parks office, we've got comment cards you can fill out and leave with us. Um, you want to make sure and send it to our office here in Kalispell, 490 North Meridian. Uh, or you can send an email. Stevie Burton, she's been amazing at collecting input throughout this entire planning process and is a whiz at organizing and collecting input. So if you'd like to just send a simple email, come right here and click an email to Stevie and that will go to her. Um, if you would like a printed copy of this EA, please let us know. We can print one out, mail it to you. If you come by our office, we'll give it to you. Um, so that is how you can comment through February 13th. And then if you're just looking for more of that background of how we got here today, as Dave mentioned, he gave you a, a really good summary, but we've really tried to be really intentional and, and engage with our public as this planning process has occurred since we got this property in October of 2021. So if you want to go through and here's the previous meetings and timelines, you can see this has been a big, long process to get here. So and then there's Dave's contact info. Um, so just want you all to know um, how you can find this information. Again, it's under the State Parks link there, or you can search. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing and Dave, I don't know if you want to put that slide back up or, if, or I'm assuming we might have some questions related to your presentation, but um, I will pause now and ask if there's any questions, um, any questions you have about any of the slides that Dave presented. If you have a question, please raise your hand. You can see by highlighting uh, there's a hand raise. Yep, somebody's already figured it out. Nice. Um, you just raise your hand and I will unmute you. And please go ahead and ask your question. If you wouldn't mind stating your name, that way we kind of know who's who's talking. So I'm going to start with Allison. Allison, I'm going to unmute you, or I'm going to allow you to unmute yourself. So please unmute yourself, Allison, and go ahead. There we go. Unmute. Okay, there we go. Am I on? There you go. Yep, loud and clear. Okay, great. Well, first of all, I just want to say, say thank you for the opportunity to be able to be here and engage in this with you guys. Um, that picture you have on the screen now is so beautiful. I want to get out there tomorrow and just go check it out. I haven't been there for since what, since last summer. So yeah, um, when I first saw it, because I'm new to the area, like a lot of people, um, but I do have the Montana mindset. So um, just so you know, <laughs> I'm not here to ruin anything. Um, when I first saw this state park, this beach, I was just in awe. It is so beautiful. And um, I would hate to see, you know, anything overbuilt or, you know, keep it as natural as it is. My question is, um, all the buildings you're talking about are any of the shelters. I'm a little, 
leery on those, but they're all going to be off the beach area, right? They're going to be near the parking lot areas or what? Yeah, I could take Good question. One. Yeah, yep. Dave, go ahead. Good um, question, Allison. Thank you. Yes, with the exception of, um, we, and we, we do propose a small picnic shelter. Mm -hmm. And I don't know uh, if you made it down to the southwest corner of the park, the shoreline there. Um, we do propose a small picnic shelter there that accommodate up to three picnic tables, an open shelter. Um, nice. And then uh, we would also place at that far location uh, a vault latrine, hopefully, uh, and we would try to place that tastefully so that it's not out in uh, too broad a view, but we do need to have facilities uh, in those more remote regions of the park. But the other buildings that you uh, that you saw in the proposal uh, do, in fact, um, we try to cluster those, um, you know, the day use amenity buildings. Um, we try to cluster those. I'm going to bring that slide up, up in the north central region of the park where we can screen them a little bit um, okay. with, with vegetation and buffering. Um, the cabins would be, and I'll find that location here again. The cabins, should they should they make the final cut, uh, would be located not down in the lakefront, um, but up in uh, in that uh, meadow that you see there in the northwest corner of the uh -huh. of the park. And that is uh, it's heavily treed right there, and so we feel that we could tuck those little cabins in uh, to the vegetation there and and make them. Uh, blend in pretty well. Oh well, that would be nice. Yeah, you hate to see all these. You know, I wouldn't want to, wouldn't want to see trees cut down and then buildings spread about around or anything. That's for sure. Um, yeah, I mean that that's like the last thing personally that I wanted. I didn't mind. You know, the trails sound great. The natural playground sounds great. There's going to be a lot of kids down there, and um, I'm really interested in the trails. Oh, you know what? You know it didn't come up because I know you can bring dogs down there at least, and you need to clean up after them, but um, a little poop station would be nice for bags and stuff. <laughs> People are going to yeah. bring their dogs. We have one of those installed right now. Oh, okay, great. The, I haven't been down there, in, in, like I said, since last year. So, sure. okay, that's that's great. But yeah, it's just so beautiful. The the more natural you can keep it, the better. Have you had any issues with um, overnight stayers that maybe aren't supposed to be staying overnight, or anybody breaking into any of these little? cabins and stuff in any of your other state parks or everything stays pretty safe and sound? Um, we're pretty, we have pretty good control over those uh, okay. problems in our state parks. Not that they don't occur, but um, you know, I can't remember the last time we've had anyone break into something uh, in, in the Flathead here in one of our parks. And um, we, you know, we're not seeing issues with overnight stays when they're not supposed to be occurring. OK, because, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll just mention the elephant in the room. There is a lot of homelessness that's going on in the parks just in downtown Kalispell. Mm -hmm. it, uh, it's yeah, it's it's sad. And I know it's a, pro it's a problem everywhere. It's a problem in every state. So I just didn't know if that would extend right. the problem. That's what I was worried about. Yeah, we don't anticipate that. I, I, okay. I don't really think that would be a problem here. OK, well, great. I appreciate this meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Really appreciate it. All right, so um, Denise, I see your hand is up, so I'm going to allow you to. There you go. You can unmute yourself, Denise, and feel free to answer, ask your uh, question. Okay, great. Hi there. Um, my first question is: What was the number of participants in the second scope, the open house portion? There were about sixty-five people who participated in the um, in the uh, actual open house in the park, and then it was about twenty-five folks who participated in the virtual meeting uh, that we followed that up with. Okay, so then my follow-up question to that is: if there were nearly thirteen hundred participants in the first scope. The majority of whom want rustic, natural, and day use. Um, how does that 90 people uh, override uh, the 1300 people? 
Does that make well, sense? Yeah, I think I see what you're asking. It's so to be clear, uh, you know, we're scoping for ideas. Not it's not a it's not a vote. We the MEPA process is not a, a vote. Mm -hmm. um, but what we're trying to do is ascertain uh, the 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 setting and service level that people want to see. So what you see here is a is a proposal that we think um, is a compromise to satisfy the desires for there there were a fair number of people quite a few people that hoped to see some overnight accommodation and there were quite a few people that hoped to not see any overnight accommodation so what you see here is a very light touch for overnight offering um, you know there there's no rv camping um, there are only three reservable features here by comparison most of the state parks in our region here have somewhere between 30 and 50 campsites um, and, you know, and we have group campsites and we have RV and tenting opportunities and a, and a wide range of uh, camping opportunities. So we're providing a light touch here for the not insignificant portion of people who participated that do want to see some overnight options. And um, uh, so hopefully, um, you know, it, it's sort of a, a meet in the middle um, proposal. Yeah, to me, and, and, and one of the one of the things we're we're acutely aware of in our other parks, and that we're we're hearing a great deal of from our other recreation providers around the valley, is a, is an ex, an extreme demand and shortage for overnight opportunities that are in a public setting in an affordable manner, and so this is an opportunity for us to provide a little bit of that, and that is you know that's one of the things that's in our mission is to is to provide that so. Uh, Summers Beach State Park does have some some potential for a little bit of overnight opportunity with while still maintaining a largely uh, rustic and uh, an open state park. Uh, my other question is, um, did all the folks that participated in the first survey uh, receive the email about uh, this final phase and commenting because I've talked to so many people that initially uh, participated in that and they knew nothing about this EA. Well, I don't know that I've ever seen a more heavily advertised um, <laughs> both by us and and by outside um, uh, forces process that we've done. I, I think I've seen this open house and this process announced on every media in the valley. And then we've sent out extensive lists to anyone who's participated in this process along the way, uh, have received postcards, keeping them informed of the process along the way. And I don't know that number. I'm sure I can find it for you, Denise, but it was a great many postcards um, and notifications sent out to folks to let them know. Okay, and we've already received and we've already received up uh, even in the first week of the of the uh, EA being up for public review. We've are, already received substantial amount of comments, so it appears that people are are pretty well aware of it. OK, well, that's good to know, because a lot of people that uh, told me they did the first survey didn't know anything about this. So I got an email. I just assumed everyone did that participated prior. Yeah, lots yes, and lots and of just to follow up on that, that only the folks who signed up when we didn't when we sent out that original survey, we did ask them to make sure to select if they wanted to receive a follow up notification. So um, if folks want to receive notifications, they definitely need to sign up for them. But we can still we still have time to to get them this information if they if they do need it. OK, great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Denise. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, Bradley, I see your hands up. So Bradley, you should be able to unmute yourself. Go ahead and ask your question. Perfect. I appreciate it, Dylan and Dave. Uh, grateful to have this opportunity to look over the plans. Um, I speak on on the way of uh, what you kind of mentioned, Dave, where there's a shortage of camping. So I live uh, right up the street as a father of a couple little kids with hopefully another one on the way. And, and we've had a really hard time finding a place to just pitch a tent and 
take my my four-year-old daughter out to look at the stars except for our backyard and uh, over the past number of years we've ended up just uh pitching my little two-man tent in the backyard and and doing it that way i would love to to have the amenities to to do an overnight stay somewhere like this that's close to the beach close to home that we can enjoy i look forward to the the playground and the the walking trails for my kids to be able to experience the wildlife um couple questions I had first off from my wife, who, as we've been down there over the past number of years, uh, mosquitoes have been a bit of an issue uh, because of the, the wetland area. Is there any uh, mitigation uh, thought of for, for that if this is developed more? In, I'll, I'll go ahead and answer that one. Uh, and I'm sad to say I, I don't have a great answer for it, Bradley. You're not the first one to ask that. Um, that's something we need to look into. We we historically have not done mosquito mitigation. We haven't had parks in the past where that was an issue. Um, so I, I need to take a look into uh, any concerns uh, you know that our staff would have about us doing that from you know from from a wildlife or fisheries perspective. But I'm well aware of the need, and and in fact have experienced that myself on a number of occasions. Um, uh, particularly in that, uh, you know, June through about September <laughs> period. So I, I don't know for sure yet, but I'm well aware of the problem and we're definitely going to see if we have any options there down the road. Okay. And then my other questions uh, kind of revolve around if plan C was adopted and you move forward with kind of the, the hike bike sites, uh, I guess the first question would be, I assume those are also um regulated like fee per night it's gonna prevent people from just staying there long term correct that is correct and then uh and we have staff that monitor that so they'll monitor it on a daily basis during the open camping season and um, the hike bike sites uh, fall within our fee schedule so we have fee schedule that covers that style of camping along with all the other camping or lodging opportunities that we offer in in the park system so yes there is a nightly fee and it's administered by uh, park staff. Okay, and then the last thing uh, to wrap up with that camping, like I said, I've got a couple little kids and um, and sometimes on uh, both sides of the issue, it's hard when we're too close to other people for their noise or we're too close to other people because of uh, the little kids screaming from my site. Um, and it, I like the idea of a shared group site, um, but has can you comment on any discussion you've had about dispersing some other small walk-in sites along that trail somewhere or is it just kind of only the group site nothing else goes you know i i i think this is sort of uh, this is the compromise um to to not offering a great deal of camping i i hear what you're saying I and mean, i hear it every day from people that are having a hard time getting campsites around the valley so i'm sympathetic to that um, but right now, the proposal is what you see right there. Uh, that would be the greatest extent of of camping or lodging that we're offering in the park um, through this proposal. Okay, yeah, you know. that answers my question. I, I appreciate your time. Thanks, Ken. Sure, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Bradley. All right. Um, yeah, these are great, great questions. Exactly what we want to be here for. So any other questions you can raise your hand and i'll unmute you or you can type it into the chat if you'd prefer to do it that way um folks who are calling in uh, i think you hit star nine on your phone and that should raise your hand hopefully so i can see you uh, that you have a comment alice and your hand is up so let's see all right you should be able to unmute yourself alice and go ahead Hi again. Yeah, the fees are the are the day use fees just for out of staters or people who also live here. The way that that works is Montanans, Montana residents have the option when they register their vehicle, their light vehicle every year, their personal vehicle, right. of of paying what is what is in essence their annual uh, state park pass. So that nine dollar fee it should, if you choose to pay that, uh, and I think we're at about eighty or so percent of Flathead County residents who do pay that now. Mm -hmm. um, that functions as your 
daily entry fee to all state parks. And so you, you don't need to pay any additional day, uh, a daily use fee beyond that. Okay. A non-resident um, must pay a daily entry fee or purchase an annual pass, a non-resident annual pass. Okay. Yeah, I do pay that fee already. So that, yep. that's, so how do they know you paid it though? Is, it some, is there something on my license plate that shows that, that I don't, I'm not aware of? <laughs> I don't um, know. No, there's not. And, the, you know, it's the, the compliance has, has been so good with it that it's more cost effective to trust people. Okay. Um, if we have to, you know, law enforcement, you know, if there was a reason that it was necessary to check that a, a law enforcement person could ask to to see your vehicle registration and it would indicate. Sure. Yeah, you know, that you so. paid it or not, but we have not been doing that. We we simply have chosen to trust people and we've had pretty good luck with that. OK, great. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. So these are these are great questions. Any any other questions, uh, clarifications, anything you need from us? That's what we are here for. So um, please raise your hand so I know you have a question or type it into the chat. Ah, there we go. All right. Uh, Reed, uh, Reed Darrow, I think you should be able to unmute yourself. Go ahead. Okay, uh, what are the uh, camping fees and what would be the cabin fees for in-state residents? The, the, I'll share with you from our uh, campsite, our, our, our state park fee schedule, what those would be. And uh, a, a camp, uh, the, the rental for uh, for cabins and yurts depends on whether you're resident or non-resident. There's a, a resident rate and a non-resident rate. And right now, a cabin is, let me see here, a cabin for a resident is $54 per night and a non-resident is $66 per night. And then the campsites uh, for that style of, temp of campsite, which is a walk-in or bike-in campsite, is eight dollars per night. Okay, and is there a, a length of stay? Uh, yes, there is. Uh, the, there is. It's a maximum uh, stay of fourteen days in a thirty-day period. Oh wow! And that's we've that's consistent with uh, uh, with the other. Recreation providers, Forest Service, National Park Service. So we've tried to stay consistent uh, with those providers so that it's um, the same everywhere. We we don't frequently see people stay for that length, of, that duration, but um, that would be the maximum. So and that applies to both the cabins and the campsite. It does. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's thank all you, I Reed. Have. Okay. Yeah. Great. If you have any other questions, feel free to raise your hand. Um, Okay, uh, let's see. And Catherine, I see your hand is up, so you should be able to unmute yourself. Go ahead, Catherine. Catherine, you should be able to click unmute now and and ask your question. Um, well, Catherine's, I think, trying to figure out, uh, Catherine, you should be able to unmute, but if, if you're having issues, you can type it into the chat. It looks like someone typed in the chat. Can you tell me about the fire policy and campfires? You bet. Um, because of the sensitivity of that issue, we're not going to permit campfires at Summers Beach State Park. We, we do permit them in most of our other state parks in the region, not all of them, uh, uh, but we're 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 going to not uh, allow campfires, and that goes for fireworks as well. Fireworks are prohibited in all state parks. All right, thanks for the question, Kate. So there's an option. If um, oh, there, Catherine's typing it in. There you go, Catherine. Sorry, we're having issues with the. Oh, with the, there was the a mic. Little, looks like she's got one in there on the chat. Yeah. So Catherine's question is about paving. How much paving of the roads and trails will be done? So we're we're proposing to pave the entry the the entry road and parking lot that you see there in the north center of of uh, this image. 
and then and that's it. So the access to the hand launch would be gravel and the trails um, would be a, a gravel or some other aggregate, you know, crushed aggregate type of surfacing. So the, the only asphalt we're proposing is the entry road and parking lot. Thank you for that question, Catherine. All right, any other questions out there? Feel free to type into the chat or raise your hand if you'd like. Ah, oh, there we go. Karen, Karen, you should be able to unmute yourself. Go ahead. Karen, you should be able to now go up and click the unmute mic button. I'm not allowed to unmute you, unmute you there, but you should be able to use your mic. Uh, things were working smoothly till now. We're have, oh, there we go. Go ahead, Karen. Okay. Um, so if a family, a donor was willing, would you be willing to accept something like a donation of a bench? Well, you know, that's that's outside of the scope of this proposal, but we can talk about that. We do have a mechanism to um, to do that kind of work. We've done it in some of our other parks. Um, it's it's outside of this proposal, but there is a mechanism to do that. Yes. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Karen. All right, well, maybe I'll do a uh, last call for questions here. Uh, if anybody has any, feel free to type it into the chat or raise your hand. Um, and, and Dylan, while they're doing that, right, while you're thinking about any uh, additional questions you might have, I just want to let folks know the process from here is that we, we re will receive um, uh, comments on the proposal as you stated through the comment period which again is february 13th 13 um, and then our staff will um will pull all of those comments together and analyze them and from that we generate a decision notice and a decision can be to simply select one of the three proposed alternatives or it could be um, you know, a, an amended version uh, or a hybridized version of them. And so our intent is to, uh, to you know, to do that as quickly as we can given, um, but, you know, we want to also provide adequate time to fully analyze um, comments. And so, uh, you know, we would anticipate um, hopefully getting that process completed uh, this winter uh, and, 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 you know, have a decision in hand. Uh, certainly in 2023. Thanks, Dave. I see uh, Jean, uh, your hand is up, so you should be able to unmute yourself. Uh, Jean or Jean, I apologize if I'm saying your name wrong. Go ahead. It's Jeannie. Oh, Jeannie. There you go. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, that's OK. Um, on alternative B, there's a thing where the entry station it says entry station and monument. What do you mean by monument? Oh yeah, okay. I'm glad you called that out. Uh, that's a a not so clear term for just something that states where you are. <laughs> so <laughs> the name of the park, an entry sign. That's, uh, you know, I think if you, it, we have a variety of examples of that of state parks, but it would be something that just simply lets you know you've arrived at Summers Beach State Park. So that could be as simple as a sign, or it could be something. Um, you know, more artistic, uh, uh, but yeah, don't let it scare you. It's, uh, <laughs> we don't envision anything too grandiose for that. We just haven't had a chance. If if we get to that phase in the design phase, that's where our design and construction 
geniuses uh, come in and start helping us out with some of those ideas. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. I volunteered uh, to be the model for a big uh, monument. Of yeah, me, not that kind of monument. Yeah, unfortunately, Dave's passed. But thank you for the question. <laughs> um, all right, well, um, last call for any any questions. Um, you might have. Um, again, th this video and Dave's presentation will be put on that parks planning page uh, tomorrow. I'll try to get that up first thing in the morning. So anybody wants to go back and review it or please do share uh, with anybody who you think would be uh, interested in this process. We really want as much public engagement with this as possible. Um, so um, please uh, help get the word out for us if you can. And we're, we'll keep trying to get the word out um, so that everybody who wants to be part of this can be. I think I saw one typed in the chat here. Uh, Kate asked, mention was made in the proposal of an unannounced development adjacent to the park. Can you say more? I, I'm happy to share what I know about it, and that is simply that um, we received notice from a consultant uh, some time ago asking the, asking us at Fish, Wild and Parks for any comments or concerns about um, a conceptual or uh, uh, maybe conceptual is not the right word, a, a proposal to develop a, a subdivision through, uh, north of Summers Road across the street from the park. Um, so that's not, as I understand it, that's not a proposal that's in front of uh, the county at this time, but they simply reached out to us to ask about, uh, to inform us that they're thinking about it and to ask us for our opinion about impacts. So we include that consideration in the EA in the form of what cumulative impacts might be in the event that that did occur. And um, so we didn't, you know, MEPA asks us not to plan in a vacuum and to look around at the, you know, the uh, around the boundaries of the park and see and be aware of other actions that could cumulatively create effects. And so we've tried to address that in the EA to the best degree possible. It's still uh, just a proposal and we don't know a great deal of detail about it. Yeah, good, good question, Kate. And I think I see some bubbles. There might be somebody else typing in a question as well. So I'll pause a little longer. Oh, thank you. Oh, well, yeah. Thank you for the question. So seeing uh, kind of questions slowing down here. Oh, no, nope, they're oh, Lee. Yeah, go ahead, Lee. You don't have to raise your hand. You're the boss. I wasn't sure if you gave me full uh, powers of the mouse. I was just going to mention to Kate that on a on a subdivision proposal, um, when we receive official notification of that, we we respond to that proposal with any uh, recommendations that we would have about impacts and stuff and how to deal with uh, whether it's wildlife impacts or or other things. Not not a we support, we don't support, but we we just describe to them all the things that we feel might be uh, things to consider as impacts of that subdivision. And we would do that once we received it in a different process. Yeah, thank you, Lee. All right, well, uh, I know folks probably are either holding off on dinner or are excited to get to dinner or miss dinner or have been eating dinner with us. So I want to respect everybody's night and cut everybody loose. But thank you again. Really appreciate uh, you joining us tonight and being engaged in this process. It's a really special place. Uh, I know for our family, it's a special place at Summers Beach and Dave has poured countless hours into this process. So uh, Dave, thank you for uh, for the great presentation tonight. And please reach out to us if you have any questions uh, after tonight's meeting. And if you're having any issues with the EA or providing comments, please um, don't hesitate to reach out to us here at the Kalispell office. So with that, Thank you, everybody, for the great questions and being here tonight, and um, have a great night. Thanks, everybody.